Hello and welcome everyone. I'm your host Osama Gawish and this is Untold Stories podcast. Last week we hosted two sisters who survived the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. We listened to their untold stories and how they are working hard to save their father's life from the prison in Rwanda. Today, can you imagine that we have more than 2 million untold stories to tell, to know more about it, and to stand in solidarity with it? I'm not sure if we have enough time in this podcast to tell these 2 million stories, but they need us to talk. They need as many as podcasts, TV shows, articles, op-eds to highlight their struggle and to reveal the truth about their miserable lives. Today, we will listen to the untold stories of the Uyghurs who are suffering from a new genocide. In 2018, the United Nations revealed that up to 2 million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities are believed to have been placed in a sprawling network of detention centers across the region, where former detainees said that they were subjected to indoctrination, sexually abused, and even forcefully sterilized. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has said China is committing genocide and crimes against humanity. The U.K. Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, has said that the treatment of Uyghurs amount to appalling violations of the most basic human rights. The UK Parliament declared in April this year that China was committing a genocide in Xinjiang. Earlier this year, leaked documents known as the China Cables made clear that the camps were intended to be run as high-security prisons with strict discipline and punishments. The Chinese government's actions in Xinjiang have violated every single provision in the United Nations Genocide Convention, according to an independent report by more than 50 global experts in human rights, war crimes, and international law. The report, released in March by the New Lions Institute for Strategy and Policy think tank in Washington, D.C., claimed that the Chinese government appears the state responsibility for an ongoing genocide against the Uyghur in breach of the UN Genocide Convention. China denies allegations of human rights abuses, saying the centers are necessary to prevent religious extremism and terrorism. This month, a group of senior UK lawyers on unofficial tribunal investigating China treatment of the Uyghur minority group has concluded that Beijing is committing genocide and crimes against humanity. The tribunal details systematic human rights abuses, including forces labor, torture, and religious destructions against Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Sir Geoffrey Nice, the chair of Uyghurs tribunal in the UK, said, and I quote, On the basis of evidence heard in public that the tribunal is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the PRC, by the imposition of measures to prevent persons, intended to destroy a significant part of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, as such as committed genocide. The Uyghur Tribunal in the UK was established in September last year with the help of the NGO Coalition for Genocide Response to investigate ongoing atrocities and possible genocide against the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other Turk Muslim population. More than 30 witnesses, including Uyghur refugees, lawyers, and academics, gave evidence in three series of hearings this year. Their testimonies included accounts of beating, rape, and torture detention center in Xinjiang, home to millions of Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minorities. In this episode, I will start with an interview with, uh, with Sir Geoffrey Nice, the Uyghurs Tribunal Chair. Then I will be joined by two exiled Uyghurs, Raihan Isat and Norseman Abdul Rashid, to know more about their untold stories and their campaign to release their relatives from jail in China. So let we let we welcome my first guest in this episode, Sir Geoffrey Nice, the chair of Uyghurs Tribunal in the UK. He has been pastor since 1971 and served as a part-time judge in England between 1984 and 2018. Between 1998 and 2006, 
He led the persecution of Slobodan Milosevic, the former president of Serbia, at the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He was Grisham College Professor for Law from 2012 to 2016 and was a chair of China Tribunal. So thank you very much, Sir Geoffrey, for joining me today. Okay. So, uh, in your conclusion, you believe that China is committing genocide against Uyghurs minorities. So, in what basis did you come to this conclusion? Well, um, thank you for your generous introduction. Um, A couple of points. Uh, This tribunal was not composed of lawyers. It was very important for me and for Nick Vetch, with whom I created this tribunal, he's a businessman, that this is a tribunal of people, not of experts or lawyers or human rights activists or anything like that. And so our seven other colleagues, of course, very senior in all their different fields, one or two of them having had some legal education or indeed legal background, but they were acting not as lawyers, but as citizens, as was I. We took the law from other lawyers, and we just operated like a jury. And that's very important, because the reason for an informal tribunal such as ours is that world systems have, in some way and in some detail, failed. And if they've failed, the last thing you should be doing is trying to imitate them by setting up a proper court or having lawyers or judges. No. The people want an answer to a question that has not been properly asked and answered by others, and therefore it is a group of people. Just as a jury in an ordinary trial in so many countries that decides that issue. The second point is I can't really say about what we found beyond what is in the judgment, because the judgment is of the nine of us, and it's there for everyone to see. But it is quite important, given what you said about the New Lines report, that we distinguished, or we were different from the New Lines report. We did not find genocide on all five possible bases under the Genocide Convention. No. We looked very carefully at the evidence. We decided to apply the strictest possible standard to our conclusions, proof beyond reasonable doubt, and found only that uh, genocide was committed by imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and that was done with the intent to do precisely that. Other acts that might look like, might even be in the view of some people, other limbs of the Genocide Convention, causing bodily harm, uh, inflicting conditions of life and so on, forcibly transferring children. Well, there may have been evidence of those things, but they were not the basis of any finding of genocide, which was very much more narrowly dealt with than by one or two of the other reports to one of which you've referred. So, however, the Chinese embassy in London said maybe a few hours after your conclusion, and I quote that, The so-called Uyghur Tribunal funded by the terrorist and the separatist organization World Uyghurs Congress is nothing but a political tool used by anti-China and separatist elements to deceive and mislead the public. It is not a legal institution, nor does it have any legal authority. So, Sir Geoffrey, this is a huge argument from Chinese, actually, about the Uyghur Tribunal. How do you see this argument? Well... First of all, they're completely right. We have no power. Uh, Indeed, it's the very fact that we have no power that gives us power. We have no interest. We're not particularly 
interested in the Uyghur people. I don't mean that in any sense offensively. We're no more interested in them as a group of nine citizens than we are in other groups of citizens around the world who complain of being persecuted by their own or by other states. So um, that's the first point that's quite important to bear in mind. The second point is that, um, so we don't mind the fact that we have no power. It's good having no power because we make a decision about a fact, nothing more than that. We say that this fact is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, nothing more than that. And then it's for other people to say whether they want to use that fact or whether they want to challenge that fact. Now, the, the People's Republic of China, in making the sorts of observations it makes, does nothing, I'm afraid. Well, I'm pleased, actually, <laughs> but it does nothing to deconstruct the argument. It doesn't say the argument or the analysis of the evidence is in any way wrong. Nobody else has said that either. The judgment stands. And as to the various ad hominem or personal attacks on us as being whatever it is, spies or creatures of the West, well, I don't mind what somebody says about me. It doesn't bother me at all. Hmm. But I do slightly take offence on behalf of my colleagues. There are, I think, five of them are professors in very different disciplines, education, I think, and anthropology, and all sorts of things around the world. These are very senior people who gave their time free, no payment of any kind, having no particular interest, just to answer this question on behalf of the people of the world, the citizens of the world. And it's unfortunate that China should say such terrible things about them. There's that truth in that, of course. It's also interesting to note that China was invited on many occasions throughout the process to take part in the proceedings, to come and say what it would like about the evidence that was being heard. It never accepted that opportunity, and it chooses really to stand a long way away and to shout rude things through a megaphone. <coughs> no value to anyone. Okay. Finally... yeah. Finally, we specifically invited China to consider <coughs> submitting itself to the jurisdiction of the only world court that can deal with breaches of the Genocide Convention by a state, the International Court of Justice. Now, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> there, are various, there are various technical difficulties in the way of another country taking China to that court, but it could say, oh, come on now, we aren't afraid of these allegations or of this finding by the Uyghur Tribunal. We will submit to the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and let that court decide. It hasn't done that. Hmm. This actually was a, a very common question on the mainstream media who covered that tribunal conclusion. So while this tribunal doesn't have any power of enforcement or legal authority and it's just releasing facts, as you said, Sir Geoffrey, so uh, how can this conclusion, this verdict against China push the international stage, the international community to hold China accountable and to help Uyghurs? Sorry, I was coughing. <laughs> I didn't hear the last bit. Um, yeah. How this what? Um, how, how this conclusion? So you, you said that, okay, you are agreeing with the Chinese that you don't have any power of enforcement or okay. legal authority. Well, how, I see. How can it, how can it work? Well, <coughs> we don't know whether it will have any effect at all. Yeah. But it may have an effect. And this is how it may have effect. Let's um, set aside for the moment, governments, and just consider something like a university or a school 
or even the ordinary citizen buying a computer or a T-shirt made of cotton from Xinjiang. All of these bodies or individuals uh, have decisions to make. And as part of their decision-making process, they have duties to perform, duties they owe to their fellow citizens. You don't sit where you are, Sana, somewhere in England, and Nursiman doesn't sit where she is, and I'm not sure where she is, but I can see her. She doesn't sit there free of obligations to each other. I owe you duties. I owe Nursiman duties. Both of you owe me duties because we have universal rights. And therefore, by informing individuals, but also big, big bodies like airlines, travel companies, universities, schools, medical research centers, of a fact, then all of those individuals and bodies have to say, right, I have to make my decision whether to do this or that, whether to buy this or that. I now have to take this fact into account. And the same thing applies to governments when, for example, they make trade deals or when they decide whether to send diplomats to the Beijing Olympic Games. Well, not the Beijing, the Winter Olympic Games. Yeah. So my final question, Sir Geoffrey, um, it's what is the next step for Uyghurs Tribunal? Um, after this verdict, is still any hearings? You will accept any witnesses, any testimonies, or you're, you're done, your your job? Well, we're probably done. Um, we've got to finish producing the long version of the judgment, which will be exactly the same as the judgment itself, but which will have uh, several hundred pages of um, uh, appendices containing some of the very large quantity of materials that's in our archives. And having done that, we've probably done. We may uh, explain the position, uh, the process, to people such as yourself, if that is helpful. But let me return to the um, image of the jury in a trial. In England, juries mostly do criminal trials, but in America, they also do civil trials very regularly, trials of non-criminal cases. When the jury, the jury comes in as a group of people who know nothing. They start with a white sheet of paper and they add to it the evidence that is presented to them. They're told about the law. They make a decision. In a criminal case, having, let us assume, the jury has brought in a verdict of guilty in some way. Having brought in their verdict, the jury walks away. But that's not the end of the story, because the judge has to do something, sentence. Probation service has to do something. Prison service has to do something. Hmm. Social services has to do something. And quite possibly governments have to do something if the particular case means the law needs to change. And it is far better that there is this separation of functions. We make no recommendations. It's not for us to tell the world how to run itself. We just present a fact. And then because all these other bodies, we can reasonably assume, will act with moral and ethical responsibility, they then have their part to play. So maybe this is the end of us. We yeah. don't necessarily expect to do any more. Thank you very much, Sir Geoffrey Nas, for joining me today in this episode. And um, let me introduce our two guests, our two exiled Uyghurs in this episode. Joining me on Colin now, Raihan Asad is a Uyghur human rights advocate and lawyer. Raihan is a non-resident senior fellow with the Strategic Litigations Project at the Atlantic Council and a graduate of Harvard Law School and a former anti-corruption attorney at a major U.S. law firm. Since 2020, she has led a public campaign for the release of her brother, Iqbar Asad, who has been held in Xinjiang internment camp system since 2016, and on behalf of the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China. So, Raihan, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, 
Okay, and our, our second guest is Norseman Abdul Rashid, joining us via Zoom, is an Uyghur wife, mother to her seven years old daughter. Norseman is a marketing executive and an MBA graduate. She's currently living in Istanbul, Turkey, and desperately looking for her family members who are detained in China's camps. So thank you both for joining me today. And let me start uh, with you, Raihan, and please unmute yourself. Um, I read many articles about your brother, Iqbal, who are in jail in China. So um, please tell us more about his story and what happened with him. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm you here. can, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, here's a disclaimer. Personally, I don't like the word exile because I didn't choose to be in exile. And I think, like, you know, I know a lot of people... Um, they chose some sort of political activism and hence they were forced to leave their countries uh, to become an exile. In my case, like it just very different. Like I was, um, I grew up in Xinjiang uh, back in the days when um, things were quite normal, I would say. Of course, there's always some sort of discrimination uh, when you are ethnically a different community. Um, I think in some ways, you know, I've been thinking a lot, and in some ways, you can compare to the African the discrimination against the African American here in America to what Uyghurs uh, did go through. Uh, but at the same time, like you know, I think um, if you are somebody like me who, you know, grew up in a major cities like Urumqi, where I'm from, then we didn't have much troubles. Um, I think our trouble is mostly related to not. Um, having the opportunity to get a passport or like, you know, getting a passport for an Uyghur person, always very difficult. You know, you need to get so much documentation and so forth. So, the, and I think like, you know, me becoming an exile is by, not by choice. It was by force. And that force was the Chinese government. Um, so at the time, this was like 2015, I was studying, um, at the Harvard Law School, I was finishing up my school and things were fine. And early 2016, like, you know, I felt like life just couldn't be kinder to my family. Like my brother um, is a very prominent tech entrepreneur. If anything, he was very well known within the Uyghur community and very much revered, um, not only because of his very savvy tech skills, but at the same time, he dedicated his life to uh, causes like helping kids with disabilities or helping the elderly and so forth. And as a result, the U.S. government and uh, U.S. State Department invited him to come on to this program called the International Vista Leadership Program that have produced many world leaders, including the likes of um, Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, or... Um, mm. Gordon Brown of the UK, Margaret Thatcher, all these figures. So he comes onto this program and I had a wonderful time to very briefly uh, meet with him here in New York and Washington DC. Um, but within weeks after returning from this trip, like we had no idea that a, a nightmare was about to ensue. Uh, because his trip to the U.S. coincided at the time when the Chinese government was creating these mass internment camps and his travel to the U.S., that is a foreign connection by definition in the eyes of the Chinese government viewed as you are infiltrated with Western ideology. Thus, you need to be re-educated. So they threw him into one of those camps. Um, and that's... Um, the first few years, I was silent because I was very much afraid of speaking up. You know, um, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, in China, there is no freedom of expression. But um, because Chinese government is so powerful, they can also control you while you're overseas. Like, I was very much afraid that if I do speak up, what does that entail? Like, what kind of ramifications um, for my parents? And that was the reason I was silent for a few years, but the news coming out is just worse and worse. Like, unless I really do take action, I don't see any change happening anytime soon. And so 20, 20 May um, 9th, I shared my story in the New York Times. And mm. after that, I became a voice 
for the OU community and especially individuals like my brother and most importantly my my brother you know I'm I'm an extension of his being and I'm his voice because otherwise like he can't express himself like he's locked up in the dark corners of the world that nobody yeah. can hear his voice or plea to be freed yeah when i prepare for this episode i managed to see many many stories many personal stories like your brother like norseman's family and many other uyghurs still in jail in these camps in china so norseman um, i want to thank you for joining us today and i'm um, following up your family's story and if if you just tell us what happened with your family why they are still in jail and where have been now Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, like uh, we are four siblings and we used to have a happy life with our parents in Kashgar in western part in China and uh, like everything was normal until 2017 like my parents was retired my father was a retired government worker and my mother used to manage our family business and my two brothers uh, they used to have a uh, auto spare part business in Kashgar and me and my sister uh, used to ha- used to praise it by the government as a wonderful student and I had a chance to studying abroad so all of my family members living a happy life and the government also praised us just because my parents uh, support our education that's why me and my sister had a good chance to study in the best university in china and also had a chance to study abroad but all of a sudden everything changed and i can say that nothing changed about my parents and my two brothers they keep trying to be a good citizen of china but the chinese government changed it their policy changed it so uh, they cut off the communication and uh, like after 18th of June 2017, I can't reach any of my family members and friends, relatives. And then after a year, and I like in 2018 in February, and I learned that my home locked outside and there is no one any, anymore. That means that my parents and my two brothers are arrested, and and it's I. I can say that, like, at that time, I was used to see people testifying about their missing family members, and I was I keep listening the the testimony of the camp survivors, and it's really hard for me to uh, believe that my parents and my two brothers are also one of these concentration camps. But unfortunately, in June 2020, I was confirmed that all of them are arrested and sending to prison and they also get long-term prison sentence. Like my, my father was sentenced 16 years, 11 months. My mother was sentenced 13 years and my elder brother sentenced seven years and my younger brother sentenced 15 years, 11 months. And I have no idea about the exact reason why they are arrested, hmm. but according to the Chinese embassy in in Turkey in Ankara, and they said that uh, they are arrested according to the law of China, and that they asking me to go back to China if I really want to know the reason and do something for my family members. Hmm. But unfortunately, it's not uh, it's not a good idea to go back to China. I, I, I think, yeah, th- this is a good question for you, Raihan, um, as an advocate and lawyer. How a uh, human rights ag- advocate, um, how do you see this uh, China narrative? If you want to meet your family, if you want to do anything to your family, just come back to China and you are very welcome. No, um, I think one one needs to bear in mind that I narrowly escaped from the Chinese government's concentration camps. Um, you know, had I gone back, I would have been in the same position as my brother is. That is a reality. And the Chinese government is painting like, oh, like, you need to learn. 
wait, is it a crime that you know you have a relative and a sister in a foreign country? Like, there's no other way to learn about what's happening to your family unless you're there. Like, there are millions of Chinese citizens study abroad. Why nothing happens to their family members? They can, you know, continuously talk to them and learn about what's happening to their families. Why, uh, when it comes to Uyghur? lives then you know like there's a totally different narrative you must return i think that is a lure of the chinese government to set up uh for the uyghurs to just you know be sent to camp so um it's good that nur saman uh, obviously didn't listen uh and there has been cases where uh several uyghurs um especially this girl two 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 girls that i think their stories need to be told is that both of them have phd degrees incredibly highly well educated um but because of not being able to communicate with their family members um they were just so scared and um they ended up um returning to china and both of them ended up in the camps and one actually even passed away and uh, she she's a phd student from japan you know like it, it, young lives like this are destroyed i mean she had the very bright future way ahead of her and then now she ended up in the camps and died so no i think the chinese government is just using it as a pretext for old uyghur people to return so that there are no voices like mine loud enough to raise awareness yeah and um, today you wrote on your twitter i hand that i talked to a judge on a separate matter at the end of the call the judge said i'm sorry for what's happening to uyghurs keep up the good work stay safe so how did you receive such messages you know it was I just couldn't even speak like you know this is a totally separate matter like I was talking to a judge and then like towards the end and then she just like said hey like you know I've known your work like you know keep up the good work I'm so sorry what's happening to all your people and I was just I was speechless and you know like as a lawyer judges are somebody that we deeply respect like appearing before judge and just having that kind of validation that you're doing amazing work and you know like your fight is the words you want i mean it's an a validation and an affirmation there has been a lot of times i was very much discouraged because of the disinformation of the chinese government as um some of listeners may know or may not know as the issue getting more and more publicity there has been a deliberate attempt from the chinese government to distort the narrative as to what's happening so on twitter for example you see like either bots or some new york times call it like useful idiots like some uh, <laughs> american you know they they are influencers like who have gone to china and yeah. like you know they they actually only are allowed to film certain places in xinjiang and what we call the disnification of genocide right and and then they they came back and say oh like everything is normal life is beautiful uyghurs are living happily so these useful idiots like were able to shape the narrative of what's happening so so then you get discouraged but suddenly you hear from a judge who spent her entire life and career for advancing justice to to hear like what you're doing is absolutely admirable and i realized that i should not let those voices to discourage me but look at these voices and uh and their views of what's happening to the Uyghur people yeah yeah regarding these voices norseman do you think that the international community the western governments and ministry media around the world are backing Uyghurs against China's genocide it's it's really conflicted like especially like in international media there are so many news about Uyghurs and sometimes there they, they are, there are news try to watch watch the genocide of Uyghurs and they, in Turkey it's also same and uh, like there are many news agencies they work for China and uh, they try to uh, portray that the Uyghurs in in Xinjiang living a happy life and uh, like the people uh, like us they are lying and uh, like they do it with a political uh, polit- political reason and they try to like they try to 
say that the what the, what the Chinese government doing is the, is is correct and it's it's really disappointing but uh, this is our reality what we should do as Rehan said we should keep going we should keep working on be the voice of our people and uh, like at, at the end I really want to see my parents and the brothers again and so I will keep going. <laughs> Yeah, and um, Raihan, back to you again, that China denies all allegations of human rights abuses, saying that these centers are necessary to prevent religious extremism and terrorism. So from your experience during the, 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 the advocating of Uyghurs, what are your views on that? You know, um, yeah, 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 I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be um, a, a thoughtful in my response. Um, so the Chinese government has this kind of notion that this is about religious extremism. It has nothing to do with that. Um, and let me give you an example. Like I grew up in a family, um, it very much, you know, I think we're in quite a bit secular. If anything, like we were not even allowed to learn anything about Islam because both my parents are, actually my dad is a, an, a government official and my mom is a professor. So in China, especially in the Uyghur region, if you are, if you fit into the broader category of like public servant or like a person who works in education, you're not supposed to have religion. The communism or Chinese government, Chinese characteristic of communism is your religion. So we grew up in that kind of environment, right? So you don't have religion. And so what does my brother have to do with religious extremification if that is the case? Like, you know, it has nothing to do with that. It's just a pretext. And a lot of which happened since 2001 when um, during the September 11. As you know, uh, when President Bush declared that, you know, this global war on terror and so, you know, said like, you are either with us or them. I think the Chinese government was very successful in that respect to align, its, align itself with the West and then completely turn around to say, oh, I have Muslims in my backyard, right? And I think in that moment, truly was a marker in in some ways like for the Chinese government to slowly, slowly start to discriminate Uyghurs or cracking down any form of like religious belief. Like in the suburban areas, Uyghurs do tend to practice religion and that was um, actually curtailed. But then in two, you know, as 10 years later, 2009, we had some sort of um, uprising against these kind of expression or uh, lack thereof, and also like early form of forced labor. Um, so I think the Chinese government really manipulated in some ways this global war on terror and its devastating effect on the Muslim community all around the world. And that is something that, you know, I'm very critical of the US foreign policy when it comes to this particular issue. Um, because I think if anything, we learned that when Western countries leading democracies like the US and the UK um, have this disastrous foreign policy, it affects human beings all around the world. And Uyghurs were one of the extreme examples of that. So um, by and large to say that, Many people who are in the camps right now are Uyghur intellectuals like my brother who have never practiced religion whatsoever and still ended up in the camps. So what does that say about the Chinese government that they are actually, this is about countering terrorism. It has nothing to do with that. But if there is, if there is a genuine attempt that there is extremist Uyghurs that the Chinese government needs to fight against, be my guest, but do it in a lawful way, not by criminalizing an entire culture and uh, Uyghur identity and entire people as a whole. Like uh, like Nurusaman's family, all of them. I mean, just think about it for a second. Four family members are all in the camps. Like each time when I hear like her story and like, you know, what's happening to her entire family members, 
and it's just so devastating and the, these are what the chinese government is doing is nothing but destroying beautiful families like ours now man and norseman my question also you, you pinned the tweet on your twitter showing yourself talking about your home so would you please tell us more about what happened to your house in china Yeah, as I said, I was lost contact with my family members since 2017. And this year in August, uh, the ITV news journalist in Beijing, uh, they they made to go my uh, go my home and visit. visit. Uh, they called me in front of my door uh, and uh, let me give me a, give me the chance to see my home by my eyes after four years. And at the beginning, I completely cannot recognize because it's it's totally changed, and some of the parts of my home are just collapsed because no one taking care of them anymore. The trees, the flowers, everything that my mom worked hard to make my fa- my, my make my house beautiful, everything is just disappeared, and like. It's, it was a nightmare that day I was like, I know my, all of my family members are arrested and that they are suffering in the camps. But that day, it's, it's again, it, it, like my heart, like I can't describe my feeling. I feel like I, I, I'm so much close to uh, lost all of my family members too because in four years, my home changed a lot and I can't even recognize them at all and I, I'm really afraid what happened to my parents because they are living in the camps and the, the, uh, under the torture and the, the bad uh, condition and the, like uh, it's yeah. hard to imagine what what's happening and the, if if they are still alive or not and uh, this is such a yeah, I, I think every Uyghurs living the same fear with like me and the, like we just don't know because we did, we did, we didn't have a chance to see our home. Like I, I was the lucky one. After four years, I saw what's happening to my home, and I can guess what's happening to my parents and two brothers, too. And. W- in your opinion, why Chinese government prevent you and Trahan and any Uyghur abroad to reach out to his family or even talk via the phone or whatever? Yeah, like they just don't want the international world to know what's happening. Actually, before 2017, when I studying here and my parents not talk about anything happening around they just talk about what they eat what they what they did what like they just talk about their self because the, the phone always hearing heard by the police so actually the, the, the Chinese government don't need to do such a thing because before that my parents also can't uh, like they're afraid to talk about what's happening to there, but now they they completely completely cut off the communication and they just try to hide everything happening there. Yeah. Raihan, um back to your personal story with your brother. One day you wrote for the Atlantic Council that the United States can lead the way to ending China's modern slavery. How can Biden's administration do this? Raihan, please uh, unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I think this crisis is truly a global crisis because, you know, what's happening in China's border doesn't stay over there. It has always exported to overseas like you know when when we are buying products from the Uyghur region or even broader china at this point we're not just like importing goods we're actually importing human suffering 
and that is a reality. There has been well-documented effort to this point that many brands are actually like using Uyghur forced labor. So this is why like I want to briefly talk about how modern slavery is practiced in the Uyghur region. Now, first and foremost, like you, we have like these camps in the Uyghur region where people like my brother and Nur Simon's family are within the camps. But at the same time, within these camps, that there are forced labor factories embedded into it. So during the day, like these innocent people are going through political indoctrination and all sorts of dehumanizing treatments. But then at the same time, they're working against their will. And their labor has actually have become the drivers of China's economy. So that is one thing. And the other way is the Uyghur first labor uh, is very much embedded into like broader Chinese economy at this point, because many Uyghurs were bused to um, and they were herded onto the train and they were sent to other cities like, you know, closer to Shanghai, um, and other parts of China, and they're working there against their will. And why do I say against their will is that oftentimes the Chinese government would ask families that, you know, like if if you as a young man or if you are as a young girl who is capable of working um, and become the drivers of the Chinese economy, economy, if you don't go to those forced labor factories, then your parents will be sent to camps. What do you do? You would do anything to save your family. So these innocent people, these like, you know, people with no agency and no voice ended up going to these forced labor factories, where inevitably, I think um, you are you are being very vulnerable, right? Like, because, you know, if you're a young woman, and, and this happened before, like, you know, if you could be bullied, like, you know, and you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, you come from a very different tradition, and you really need to a whole new way of life while being separated from your family. So that is the other way of um, the Uyghur forced labor thriving in the Chinese economy. And third way is oftentimes the Uyghur forced labor and sometimes like it can export it to the United States directly. This is where uh, there has been cases where the U.S. Custom and Border Protection Agencies were able to seize 13 tons of Uyghur prisoners here um, at the U.S. border. And that is one way of like direct exportation to the U.S. market. And second way is through other countries, like exporting to India. And from India, it is getting transferred to re-exported to the U.S. So this is why I think the Biden administration, a first and foremost, must prioritize curtailing yes. forced labor. Right, because modern slavery, uh, this is a form of human trafficking. When we talk about human trafficking, we also talk about oh, sex trafficking, but it is a human trafficking, and we really need to reject this. And that that is one thing, and this is why the Biden administration just signed on to a law, uh, a bill called Uyghur Forced Prevention Act. Now it became a federal law, which means that, you know, um they have to crack down Uyghur forced labor or goods produced with slave labor. labor. Yeah. Um, and that means that our global economy needs to reject this. But at the same time, I'm just like um, trying to understand how the companies are going to respond to this too. So global companies and hmm. consumers need to be more conscious consumers. We need to understand these are the products that are actually made with forced labor. So I'm going to reject that. I, I'm going to like, go into an Apple store and, and say, hey, I learned that you are actually complicit in the use of Uyghur forced labor. Do you have any response to that? I think we need to confront these uh, big tech giants or like big corporations to make sure that, you know, we need to hold them to account. And third way is that, you know, I think um, oftentimes, like, you know, now the Olympics is coming up, the U.S. actually yeah. calls for a diplomatic boycott. You know, countries, there are not many, but some, like, especially leading democracies have been saying, like, um, while we need to do trade with China, it will, should not come at the expense of uh, human suffering. Yeah. You know, I, I think we need to, even if we engage with China on trade deals or climate change or 
globe, you know, how to handle global pandemic, we should not compromise our values. The Biden administration and also just the UK and all other countries, they cannot compromise their values. Too often, the Chinese government has made it a public norm that you cannot discuss human rights abuses or anything related to human rights issues in public with me. These are the kinds of issues that you need to discuss privately. So we were, we kind of allowed the Chinese government to dictate the norms of diplomacy and it's yeah. time to reject it. Whether we need to do it publicly, privately, in whatever shape and form, we must confront China about the human rights abuses. And I think we need to make sure that individuals like my brother and Nusman Salman, like all these stories need to be told and retold. I recently was a speaker at the US Democracy Summit of Democracy, can we invite mm -hmm. President Biden? And as through that platform, I made sure that my brother's voice is heard. And I really hope like, you know, there I'm pretty sure like whether through TED Talks that so many institutions and events and conferences, Uyghur's voice need to be heard. This is um, the world's, I mean, the, the indifference of the, the international community to this point is allowing this crisis to go on for five years and beyond. I cannot wait yeah. one more day to reunite with my brother, and I'm sure Nursuman feels the same. Yeah. You know, Raihan, this is a massive point. This is a, a very important one, but there is a many pessimistic people around the world. When you talk now about this campaign, about the recent bill signed by President Biden, Many people ask, would it help? Would China respond positively to this international pressure, to this bill from the Biden's administration? What do you think? I think the Chinese government would. Um, and here's a like a recent example of that. And a lot of people are like, again, like it remains to be seen whether this is a good sign or not. Um, the, the governor of Xinjiang, who is a man known to be behind, and he's the chief architect of these concentration camps, Mr. Chen Chengbo. Um, hmm. Recently, the Chinese government released in their media that he is going to be replaced by somebody else. Now, uh, we don't know whether it was just because his term is up, is he going to uh, be uh, actually promoted or demoted? We don't know yet because the Chinese government has not released any further information as to his new role or um, no role at all. But I think it is because of the international community's criticism that the Chinese government, I think, is trying to respond to that in some ways because they understood that like these policies had uh, ramifications. Like, you know, they, they lost their reputation around the world. Like China is very much often talked about issue these days. Like, you know, everybody knows, like when, when people talk about China, before people would talk about Chinese economy, the great world, the civilization and so forth. But now everybody talks about China through the lens of Uyghurs and Hong Kong. These are, these history, that the past five years, dark history, um, actually marked a new kind of China in the eyes of average citizen around the world. And I think the Chinese government realized that while it's too soon to tell whether this person is going to be promoted or not, I don't see how he would be promoted. Because if you yeah. look at the person who replaced him, Mr. Chen is a very uneducated man. Um, he came from... Uh, at a time like you know from this people liberation army he's has this military background like he's not somebody who's very well educated and understand um you know the global ramifications of its policies and and stuff like that whereas um the his the new soon-to-be governor uh, is somebody who's well very well educated he has even phd degree and i'm not saying like if somebody is educated they would have better policies but i think that um, at least um, he understands from a policy standpoint of view, like how does it look to the outside of the world? So I think there is. And last thing I would like to highlight is that the Associated Press, um, hmm. which is one of the few media outlets that still have access to the region, uh, recently reported 
that the visible signs of repression seems to be disappearing in Xinjiang. Now, it has you know two meanings. One is just because things are becoming invisible, we need to be incredibly even more uh, careful and vigilant because sometimes when the visible repression goes away, there would be even much uh, harsher crackdown because that is happening in the dark corners, right? That's the one thing. But also in the other way to look at it is the Chinese government has realized that um, it has no choice but to open the region to some sort of investigation at some point in the future. So they're slowly making these efforts to remove these survey, like, you know, because if there's like 10 surveillance cameras in one district alone, then now it's there as like two. So they're trying to reduce the numbers and trying to create some sort of normalcy. And that in itself is a response to international criticism. And one may argue because they thought, well, maybe the policy has worked and the Chinese government already instilled so much fear among the Uyghurs and they felt like the mission is accomplished. Maybe that that could be another reason. But I also don't want to um, dismiss the yeah. power of international criticism. I, I think this is the main point I'm, I'm just um, talking about Uyghurs in this Untold Stories episode because China hiding the truth and we all know this and every single authoritarian country doing this they want to introduce a good image about jails, about um, everything to the international media however the truth is behind the bars, the truth is behind the scenes as we know in China and Egypt and many authoritarian countries. So Norseman, um, I'll back to you again. Raihan mentioned the diplomatic boycotting campaign of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. So do you think how many countries will positively interact with this boycotting campaign? Hey, I think most of the democratic countries will react like we tried so hard in Turkey too, but there is no any reaction uh, because like the the people's value is different. In democratic country, the citizens and the political politicians, they have a value and they have a word uh, to protect the human rights and the democratic values. So they, they have the responsibility to uh, honor this. So I, I I hope and I believe the democratic country uh, will join and it will definitely help the Uyghurs. Like I am sure when the pressures uh, go rise, uprise, like from the international community, China will 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 react. China will stop and will open the concentration camps. Yeah, and finally, if I ask you to send a message to your family in China. If I had a chance to send a message, and I will say sorry. Because I was grow up in a rural area, and my parents tried so hard to offer me a good education, and they really tried so hard. And... Uh, before I leave the country to for my master's degree and my parents said this is a good chance to educate yourself and we really hope you come back and serve, uh, serve your country and uh, dedicate our society. And I was live with this such a hope, but unfortunately I even couldn't tell them I graduated. And I even couldn't tell them I had a good job here, but I will say I, I, I was sorry because it's more than four years. I tried so hard, but still it didn't, couldn't save them. So I will just say sorry. And we are sorry too for your family. Um, Norsemen who stand in solidarity with you and with all Uyghurs in China and abroad. And I wish you will meet your family uh, as soon as possible. And um, the same question, Raihan, actually. It's um, a personal message from you to your brother in China.
Raihan, please unmute yourself. Thank you. You know, it's been very difficult to just like, you know, sometimes like I have this mixed feelings about speaking to him or not speaking to him. But I also know that it's very important to keep him keep in mind and then uplifting his spirit. Um I know that um yeah, it's it's a it's rather emotional, especially during the holidays, you know, where family get to celebrate together. I don't believe that I've ever felt true holiday over the past five and a half years because without him uh, in my life I think these blessed times of togetherness lost its profound meaning on me um and especially like I mean I, I love Christmas you know and I love New Year's Eve like New Year's Eve for me is a um marker for celebration of the past year but also hope for the future and as we are stepping into the new year um i think that you know it's very difficult to be hopeful because you know you, you keep fighting and and there's not yet positive news but um one thing i am trying to do is that um i think speaking up at this point and being his wife is the right thing to do and i know my brother very well he's a very driven individual um that as a tech entrepreneur but also a person with massive heart um and you know i think what is i can imagine what is truly breaking him is that his life is um wasted in these um in these camps where you know, it could have been in another world where he could have shared his, you know, wisdom, kindness, and generosity with the rest of the world instead of like having his life waste away in these camps. So, um, by constantly raising awareness about his plight, writing about him, telling his stories for people to know him, what I'm trying to accomplish is that. When the day comes, when he gets out, that he knows that his life wasn't wasted, the world got to know his story, his resilience, his humanity, but most importantly, his monumental dignity. I think when we look at the Uyghur crisis, we often see of these individuals as, oh, these are victims of the concentration camps. But if anything, Uyghur people, their resilience and humanity taught me is that their dignity is much more, um, they're much more dignified people than many who became prisoners of their material pursuit, like all the CEOs or executives, like, and so forth. So that being said, I am trying to make sure that his life is um, um, worth lived regardless of where he is now. And um, yeah, and he's truly a dignified person. And, you know, his monumental dignity is something that i'm going to defend and make sure to keep up this fight today and tomorrow and onward i believe he's proud of you raihan and with your work and i wish uh, him to be free and to be released as soon as possible thank you very much for our brave guests raihan isat and norseman abdul rashid for narrating their untold stories and to conclude this episode uyghur's life matter China should know this, Biden's administration should know this, and the international community should know and talk about this, talk about Uyghurs. In 2021, it is shameful, disgraceful, and inhuman that many leaders, politicians, journalists are turning a blind eye on what China is doing against Uyghurs minorities. As we are stepping to the new year, I wish freedom, human dignity, and safety for all Uyghurs in China and around the world. Thank you very much. See you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. You too.